part of the question. The second part is very similar. I just mentioned it. I just want to write it regarding how we can get a more accurate solution also uh, in time, in space, when we discretize a PDE. So, suppose you have determined finite difference approximations Following notation u with the time step delta x at some point x and some time instant t. So that is then a numerical solution obtained with some of, of our methods, for example, for the time centered space or whatever, upwind method, what we like, with time step, with spatial uh, grid spacing delta x, and another one with delta x half. Also at the same point and the same time instant. So we assume that we have done that for the linear attraction equation as an example, but we could also imagine to do it for Burgess equation, in this Burgess equation, whatever we like. But here we just take this as an example for the linear attraction equation ut plus c u x equal to zero where we have chosen a certain current number. So the current number is then the advection velocity little c times delta t divided by delta x. So that is then chosen to be constant in this process. So when we do a grid refinement, then we also do the time step refinement with this. Or that we consider the heat equation, which would be then what we have just been discussing with discretized with the uh, with the Crane Nicholson method. Time derivative is equal to thermodynamicity alpha times the second derivative, U would be temperature, with the stability parameter would then be in that case R alpha delta t divided by delta x squared. That would, in that case, be constant. So then, the time step is proportional to delta x squared. So when we half delta x, we take the time step then to be one fourth. And that, so then we have these two approximations with grid spacings delta x and delta x half. And again, we assume that we have a certain expression for the error. So suppose the error can be expressed as our numerical approximation using delta x at some point x sometime instant t minus the exact solution of the PDE is equal to some constant and now we express then the delta t errors the time errors also in delta x errors so then we can summarize everything under that would be then the times uh, delta x to the power p plus and error terms delta x to the power r. And again, we assume that r is greater than p. And often it, r is just p plus 1. But for example, with the central discretization that we considered before, it would be, for the Frank Nicholson method again, that would be 2, and that would be 4. Then the question is the same. How can you get a more accurate approximation?
first one that we looked at the question before the break that was regarding this discretization in ODE using two different time steps, delta t and delta t half. And here we want to do the same thing for PD discretization using delta x and delta x half. So let's look at the solution to this. First we start with the ODE problem. Um, yeah, we use now the relation that we had uh, 1. So we use 1 using the relation 1, that was the global error. Um, we use that now for delta t half instead of delta t. So imagine we have, we had already done it with delta t, then we do it now for delta t half, and then we get the following expression. Then the solution of the ODE using the time step delta t half that we determine then at some final time t minus the exact solution is then equal to this constant that is unchanged, but instead of delta t, we have now here delta t half to the power p plus an order delta t. Here it doesn't matter if it's delta t or delta t half, it just changes the constant, so the order is the same. So what we do now is we want to eliminate this error term. That is the goal. How can we do that? We can multiply this equation by uh, 2 to the power p. You see here we get here a1 delta t to the power 2 to the power p divided by 2 to the power p and we multiply by that. So then, then we get it in the same form as we had for the error term for delta t. So we then do what we do then, then is we, do, we have this multiplication to the power p times 3 minus the formula error formula 1. By that we can eliminate the leading error term and we get the following. We get, uh, so this is multiplied by 2 to the power p times our approximation with delta t half of t minus uh, the approximation of delta t at the time t. So that is coming then from equation 1. And um, then we get also here this 2 times uh, 2 to the power p. And if we subtract, we get a factor minus 1. If we take this factor directly in here, 2 to the power p minus 1, we can then get the clear, the exact solution to the ODE. And on the right hand side, we have then eliminated this and we have then only this left. If it's multiplied by something or it doesn't matter, it is still order delta t to the power r. So that means this expression here is more accurate than that we had in the beginning. In the beginning we had something that was of order p, and this is now, here we see the error, that is of order delta t to the power r, and r is larger. So that is more accurate. And this is called Richardson extrapolation. So I give this number four, and this expression that we have then derived here, I call it yr, of t is equal to, it is this expression here, and if you think about it a little bit, we can subtract this expression here and add it again, then we can write this also in the following form, so this expression then can be write in the following form, you have y delta t half of t plus the difference of that delta t half of t minus the y delta t 
of t divided by this expression two to the power p minus one. So you see this expression here, that is that is then the same as that that we had. So it's the same. So this is the same. Uh, let's see. Um, so that is what we have here. That is the same. That is the same. And that is then called the Richardson extrapolation. one, therefore we can factorize that, and then we had added it, uh, we get this, y, this to delta t half minus this, divided by this. So it's the same. What does that mean? It means that we, in a sense, extrapolate from knowing the solution with the time step delta t and delta t half, and extrapolate to the case when delta t is zero. So we can illustrate that in the following way. We imagine we have now, we express everything as a function of the time step delta t. And here we have then our, um, say our error formula, y delta t. And we imagine we have something of, of, of this, say, it is then given by the formula. In our case, it was, say, it's quadratic or whatever. Then what we have is two values. If we imagine we have here delta t and we have here delta t half, here we have then zero. So we have two values. This is our y of delta t of t. And this is our y delta t half of t. So these are approximations of the exact solution. But we know that their error is then uh, going quadratically, so that we can imagine that we, at uh, delta t equal to zero, at this extrapolated value, get very close to the exact solution. And that is what we do when we do this process. So the value that we get here, that we determine here, that is then in fact our richest extrapolation. So that is what we determine. So it is not, of course, the exact solution, but it is more accurate. As we saw, it is then of order r, while the original solutions are only of order p, which is a lower order. So that is the idea behind this Richardson extrapolation. Let's take an example. The example is the trapezoidal method. So we didn't go further, but if we would not, uh, if we do the Taylor expansion around uh, the midpoint between uh, t and t plus delta t, then we could then show that we have the numerical solution using delta t and the so the load of error would then be equal to a1 delta t to the power 2 plus an order error to the power 4. And the Richardson extrapolation then would be the following for this case.
instead call it number six. Let's see. Take it over. So just we take the formula here as it is. So then we take the value that we have computed with a finer, uh, with a smaller time step. That is, um, you can expect that is closer to the uh, exact solution than with delta t. And then we add the difference between the approximation of delta t half and delta t. It is y delta t delta t half minus y delta t, both determine the solution at the final time t, divided by p is now 2. So we get 2 to the power of 2 is 4 minus 1. So we get the 3 in the denominator here. And that is then equal to, and then we use what we had here, it is equal then to the exact solution plus this error term. But the error term in our example, the R is 4. So then we have this. So by this, we can get a more accurate solution. That is the, the clue of the Richards extrapolation. If we use two solutions, and as we see, saw over uh, to the left on the blackboard, in a sense we extrapolate to the situation when the delta t is 0. And then we get a more accurate approximation. So that is the idea for ODEs and for PDEs we just use the same idea. So that completes then the part A. Now we want to look at the part B. And um, so that is similar to A, and if we do the same arguments as we used here, then we arrive at the following. It is just an instead of using the, the delta x instead of delta t, and then we determine that at some point x, actually it will be grid point, at some time instant t, that will be equal then to the solution that we have determined with the smaller grid spacing. And remember, the grid spacing and the time step are linked, either by the current number for hyperbolic problems or the phenomenon number for parabolic problems. So then we have this, and then we add the difference that we have them obtained with the final grid at some point x sometimes it's in t minus the approximation that we have with the coarser grid delta x. And we divide by the same value, 2 to the power p minus 1. That is now coming from our accuracy in space. So that is the richest next population then in space, just taking the analogy, the derivation is just the same. And that is equal to the exact solution plus the order, in our case now it is delta x to the power r. So that is then our Richardson extrapolation. So what we have here, the r is the Richardson. So we can also write it, Richardson extrapolation. So that is then what... That is the richest In space, we have to think a little bit because in time we just go to the end time and that's it. We determine that carefully. We know when we have loops, we want to have index in this says that are real, that are not real but uh, integers. So we, we do that. We have learned about that in the exercises. But regarding now for the space, 
where can we do this? We can only do it where we have both the solution with the grid spacing delta x and delta x half. So that means we can only do it on the coarse grid. Because on the coarse grid we have both the solution with the grid spacing delta x and we have chosen them and also with the delta x half. Let's see that. We imagine we have our domain here. So that is uh, our xa and that is our xd that we discretize use equidistant grid. So this would be the original grid. So then we would introduce, so I call it a coarse grid. Coarse grid. That would then have a grid spacing delta x. Let's take it as xb minus xa. And now we use this notation nj. nj is the number of intervals. Then in the coarse grid notation, we would have the indices, we would have, we start with that notation 0, 1, uh, and so on. And we would have some, I call it now, capital J, and so on. And this would be the grid point NJ. On the fine grid, however, things are a little different. The fine grid, we will have also intermediate points. So that is the fine grid. The fine grid has then a grid spacing uh, delta x half, actually. So that is the delta x half, which is then this delta x divided by 2. And that is then equal to xb minus xa divided by 2 nj. So, and then we can also introduce then uh, the grid points for that. The grid points for that would be 0, 1, 2, and so on. And this would then be, um, if we come to this point here, that would be our little j. We can link that, you see that. The link is that the little j will be equal to our 2 capital J. And then we'll go here to the little nj and that will be equal to 2 nj. So you can then make the correspondence. In this notation then we simply have a coarse grid with the capital index uh, j. And the corresponding on the fine grid is then with a uh, lower index j two times the capital index j. So then we can use the, uh, the Richardson extrapolation at all the coarse grids, at all the coarse grid points. And then we can link them together by this correspondence that the index on the fine grid that matches is then equal to two times the index on the coarse grid. So in that way we can then use the Richardson extrapolation at all grid points of the coarse grid. So that, that is the, the, the whole point. There is a lot more to say about that. Instead of refining by a factor of 2 that we did here, we can also refine by some other factor, 10 or whatever we like. The formula is similar, just that we would not have any, like 10 for example, we'd have a 10 here, a 10 here, and a 10 here. So, but the, the otherwise it would be just sort of good. The 10 would be instead of uh, the 2. Otherwise, it would be the same. And we can also do that for elliptic problems. We have just talked about delta x here, so we don't need to take the time here. And we do it also for elliptic problems. We can do it in 2D. Similar arguments. We do a coarse grid, a fine grid with delta x, delta y, fine grid delta x half, delta y half. Then we can find the corresponding points on the coarse grid where we can do the Richardson extrapolation. 
and we can then use uh, the extrapolated value as an approximation of our exact solution because that is more accurate than the original one. In practical calculations though, and if we don't know the order yet, because here you know we have to know the order, that is important. If we don't know anything, what we do is we do a very fine grid computation and then we assume that is our quotation mark exact solution. So and then we can take that to compute the error. When we have the error, we can compute the um, convergence rate. The convergence rate, that was something that is very important, where we can check if the method behaves in the way that we expect it to behave. So, um, so that is something that we had in a couple of exercises. So when we know the exact solution or an approximation of that, convergence rate, uh, in that case I call it also P, they are related, the order and the convergence rate. That is then what we had when we compute the error, and that is we use the two norm to compute the error. And then we compute the ratio of the error determined with delta x and the error determined with delta x half. So then we compute this, the logarithm of this ratio, and we divide by the logarithm of 2. So by that we have assumed that the, let's see, I think I'll take that away. By that we have assumed that we can express our error by, now we look at the PDE problem, say u delta x, what we discussed here, with the exact u, and we have computed the 2 norm, and we assume here the gain that we have also for that, not only for one point, but also for the norm, a similar error behavior, so that this is equal to some constant times delta x to the power p plus higher order terms of x to the power r. So, and by this, when we know then the exact solution or uh, an approximate exact solution, like I said, with a very fine grid, then we can compute this error, and then we can compute the convergence rate. And then we can find out what it is, and then we, usually we know something about the method, then we can check, is it true? Do we get the convergence rate that we do expect? If we don't, there is some reason for it boundary conditions or whatever, something, and we have to check that. But that's a good way to check the solution. And it is always important, I think, anything that you do, that you do a grid refinement. If you cannot do a grid uh, refinement, you can do a grid coarsening to see the influence of the grid on your solution. That you must be sure that you can be confident in your American solution. That's very important. And these are some tools that you can use. Other things uh, that are useful are, as you saw, exact solution, then we can compute that directly. We saw here an approximate exact solution by using a very fine grid solution. You can take from the reference some literature, like in exercise 12, that Trader presented on Tuesday, the uh, reference solution by Gia et al. And um, so that there are many possibilities for that. And there is a, another thing that you can use, that is now a little remark on that, that is called the method of manufactured solutions. In the method of manufactured solutions, you construct your own solution. purposes then to validate your computer program. So, and that is due to Steinberg and Roche. 
Roach has actually written a book on that later. And the idea is, assume u of xt an analytical function. You choose as your own. And um, as an example, for the Poisson equation, I did it the following way. I chose this as sine of pi half x times the sine of pi y. So very simple. Then insert into PDE. And get then your PDE. Say the PDE is, say, uh, originally it is zero. You get then the PDE, say, into PDE, say it is zero, the PDE. But then you get the PDE is equal to some function f of x, y. You can also do it with t, whatever. In our example, e.g., we compute the second derivative of u with respect to x and the second derivative of u with respect to y of this function here. If we do that, we find out that is minus 5 over 4 pi squared and then times the function itself, sine pi half x times the sine of pi y. And then we have a right-hand side. And then we have a Poisson equation for which we know the exact solution. It is this one. So that's the trick. And then we can use that uh, to check our numerical implementation of uh, uh, fluid or heat uh, conduction problem. So that is very useful for verification. And I use that actually for uh, the Poisson equation. I, we have not so much time. I want to use the time now that is left for something else so that you get a glimpse at least of um, a CFP tool. I promised to show you something about that. So here it is. Short, but uh, you, you get some idea. There are many tools around. Probably the most well known is Fluent, ANSYS Fluent. This is a competitor, Star CCM Plus. There is also uh, Hexa, and there is uh, Open Foam, which is an open source software that we use, that Radar uses actually in the fifth year uh, for our uh, students specializing in fluids engineering. And I picked here one of the, tutor of the tutorials, and that is for the CFD simulation of a racing car. That has actually been used um, this year, last year, by one of my students in TP4165, Vega Tor, for designing the NTNU racing, electronic racing car. So, this is then just the sixth video of uh, of this tutorial and it gives you some glimpse. In this video we can look at how scenes work. Do you understand? Here you can see that scenes have in simulation workflow. Can you hear the voice or is it too low? I try can screw it up. I just want to interrupt here to show you what you get when you open Star CC Plus. You have four windows. This is they call it the Explorer pane. I had to look up what pane is. It's, it's, a, it's a window, essentially, where you can uh, choose, essentially, all what is relevant for your simulation. And that is um, the geometry. You can uh, make your grid here. You can have CAD data, computer data, design data, or you generate it with some other means, but you can do it inside. You determine what you have, gas or, or liquid, whatever you have, you can do properties density, viscosity, and so on. You determine what are your regions, um, the domains, the boundaries, 
and you define them interfaces and then with the solvers you decide what solver you use we have not yet come that far that is topic of computation heat and fluid flow uh, if you have an uh, iterative solver if you have a, if you solve it segregated that is one equation after the other or coupled and whatever you can also choose your turbulence models in here if you have turbulent flow the stopping criterion that is what we have already seen for iterative methods and then you have uh, you can have viewers that is for visualization reports to record things from uh, the simulation monitors for example the residual and so on so there's a couple of things to choose from there here you de determine your properties for example when you determine what properties of uh, air or whatever you want to have you can do that here that will be the, is the graphical window that is the output then you see something that you can then also use as a text file. So, and what I'm playing here is just the scenes tab from this, yeah, you create a from this video. Mesh, scalar, vector, or empty scene from the templates that you have here. If you're elsewhere in the tree and it's more convenient, you can also use this icon up here to do the same thing. If I were to go ahead and open up a geometry in one mesh scene, you can see in the scenes here how this is populated with geometry scene one and mesh scene one. When altering these scenes, you can go into each one of these and change the displayers and attributes. However, a better way of doing this is using the scene plot tab here. This eliminates the need for you to have to scroll back to the scenes mode each time when you're in your simulation tree. When going into the scene plot tab, you can see the displayers and attributes. Notice the other nice feature about this is when I go from geometry scene 1 to mesh scene 1 and back and forth, notice that this automatically updates. Usually when working with scenes, you're working with the displayers within your scene. Displayers show different elements of your simulation, such as mesh, geometry, and results. Each template will come with an outline one and another displayer related to the template that you select. These can be continuously layered in this so that scalars, vectors, streamlines, isosurfaces, so on and so on, can be layered one on top of the other, as desired. Now I'll make a few scenes which teams might be interested in making. I'll begin by going up to the tab of scene templates if I go to my scene plot tab, you can see I have outline 1 under splitter showing my outline. And for scalar 1, I see that I have a few options. When I click scalar 1, I have options to change the opacity, the contour style. I can select whether or not I want to display the mesh, and so on. The default behavior for contour style is to fill each cell face with one color representing the value in that field. To make this look more natural, I'm going to go from fill to smooth fill. In the next note down, I see a parts listing. This lets us select which parts we're putting into the scene for the scalar displayer. Here I want to look at scalar values on the surface of my car. So under parts, regions, I'll add in everything for the radiator. And then under subtract, I'll also add in everything, but then just take out the boundaries that I don't want. some impression what uh, you can do with this so you have first to get acquainted with uh, some of the functions by doing some tutorials and you have many of them and then you can use features and then you can do very complex flow simulations you can also do heat transfer analysis with that you can also couple other physical properties to it so it is a quite a flexible tool but it is good for using it to have some basic understanding of what is behind it that you know, I hope you will get here in this course. Okay, we have to stop here. I wish you Happy Easter.